What a marvelous God. He has done marvelous things for us. Oh. What a marvelous God. What a marvelous. He is doing marvelous things for us. The things that are impossible, the things that nobody can do, they are the things He is doing for us. What my mother could not do, my father could not do, He has done it again. privilege is a privilege to be alive and serve God. I consider this a very big privilege to stand here before you and deliver this lecture. I want to thank His Grace for giving me this privilege. I do not take it for granted. In my considered opinion, Your Grace, permit me to air what I consider as your most important achievement. The position, the values, the attributes and qualities that God saw in you before he chose you many years ago. You have not allowed new positions or power to change them. Only very few people enjoy such grace. Very humble, very respectful, a loving husband, a loving father, a loving friend very firm and decisive. We, the veterans, we are very proud of you. You have carefully and passionately identified and responded to the needs of the church since we took on this work. The Lord will continue to meet your own needs too. As you seek the happiness of the church, you and your household we continue to enjoy peace and happiness. The Lord will continue to bless you because you have been a blessing to your generation. Now, in delivering this paper, I consulted many previous workers and I want to acknowledge them. The topic, overcoming frustration, depression and suicide, is very apt and topical. It is safe to say that there is so much dissatisfaction and anger in the society 
which is causing frustration and depression. The psychosocial consequences of this are causing a feeling of inadequacy and aggression. But not only that, because of this feeling of aggression, some people are determined to escape from these burdens by committing suicide or ending it all. Before, it was unheard of for a Nigerian, a black man, wanting to take his life. But now, the rising volume and frequency of persons wanting to commit suicide have become a major cause for concern. It points to some areas that are very disturbing. There seems to be a breakdown in the support networks that we have enjoyed in Africa. Very weakened community cohesion and family relationships. It has therefore become imperative to examine this situation and recommend workable strategies to deal with them. There is no other body that is more equipped than this than the church. The church should not avoid talking about difficult subjects like frustration, depression, and suicide because many of our favorite heroes and heroines struggled with doubt and, and despair, just like we do today. Go through the Hall of Faith in Hebrew 11, and you will notice that the characters mentioned have something in common. All of them struggle with disappointment, dark past, fears, failures, and broken relationships. The God they served is the same God we serve today. You are therefore encouraged to take comfort in the following stories of redemption. David, in Psalm 69, verses 2-3, I am sinking deep in the mud, and my feet are slipping. I'm about to be swept under by a mighty flood. I'm worn out of calling for help. My throat is patched. My eyes fail looking for my God. Although David was familiar with betrayal and sleepless nights, prompting him to write songs of lamentation at various times in his life, his honest prayers have become a comfort to many Christians struggling with frustration and depression. Job 3, 20, 26. Why does God let me live when life is miserable and so bitter? I keep longing for death. More than I will seek a valuable treasure, nothing could make me happier than to be in the grave. Faithful Job faced demonic attacks unlike anyone in biblical history. His wealth, his family and health destroyed in just one day. In chapter 7 verse 16, he said, I despise my life. I will not live forever. Let me alone. My ways have no meaning. His wife responded by urging him to join her in giving up on God. But Job refused. Though he had abundant blessings at the end of the story as examples of God's reaction, the profound message here is that God answered him. Elijah, after he ran away from Ahab and Jezebel, while in the desert, he said, I have had enough, Lord, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. But thereafter, an angel touched and comforted Elijah by providing food, water, and proper rest. We remember the story of Naomi in Ruth 121, where she lamented, the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. That was after her husband and two sons died while she was living as a refugee in a foreign land. Naomi came back to her native Israel, angry and ready to end it all. But God brought Ruth to Naomi, who looked after Naomi's physical needs. She gave repeated words of faith in God and eventually provided Naomi with new hope through her marriage to Boaz and the birth of Naomi's grandson, Obed 
who later gave birth to Jesse, the father of King David. And of course, the teacher or the preacher of Ecclesiastes, he had it all. He was rich, he was wise, very powerful, and possessed everything he needed to be happy, except that he wasn't. And he took a whole book to write about all the things in life that could not give him a sense of purpose. Although there was no recorded miracle that reversed his fortune, God simply wanted to reveal the meaning of obeying his commands in chapter 12, verse 13. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of mankind. Have you ever felt like you have had enough? Have you ever been frustrated with life's problems? Have you ever been frustrated with other people? Have you ever been frustrated with God? Feeling like he doesn't care or has abandoned you? Have you ever expressed this to God? What was the result of your expression of your feelings or emotions to God? All of us experience frustration from time to time. We get frustrated when our expectations are not fulfilled. The feeling we experience when we feel disappointed or defeated and been unable to accomplish our purpose. Most times, we strive to glorify our wants and desires, our goals, our aims and ambitions. Sometimes our ambitions exceed our abilities. What are the things that normally, commonly, drive us to frustration? They are listed there. You encounter a slow driver or truck or a spoiled vehicle obstructing the road. A traffic jam preventing you from reaching an appointment. A jam or college rule or cutoff point prohibiting us from taking a particular course. A neighbor's dog or noisy generator interrupting our sleep. Being treated as second-class citizens due to our race, religion, or tribe. Sometimes this affects our professional advancement. A long queue, you just want to go to the supermarket and pick up something very small, and then you encounter a very long queue. When there is so much cold or heat disturbing our desire for physical comfort. At times, when you are searching for the right phrase or word to express yourself when it becomes difficult. Disappointment when our favorite football team is playing poorly or loses a game under controversial circumstances like Liverpool and Manchester City on Sunday. Disappointment with family, politicians, and teaching. Disappointment with coercive rules and laws. Disappointment with government policies. Disappointment with the nation's security situation. When you take on extra responsibilities and duties that add on to what you are already doing for the kingdom of God, the journey can become overwhelming and hard. When attacks on you continue to intensify and more burdens are put upon you due to the call you have on your life and the mandate God has placed on you, on your life to complete. And finally, when other people who are not serving God and are involved in sinning, wickedness and laziness and seem like they are getting continuously blessed as well. But if Jesus didn't quit his assignment, knowing he was about to die horribly and suffer, what makes you think you can quit? Sometimes the Lord allows our plans to be frustrated because it is simply not his time or his will. Therefore, you must wait for his time and his will. That is aptly captured in Proverbs 13, 12. Not getting what you want can break your heart, but a wish that comes true is a life-giving tree. God's delay are not always deniers. Two, sometimes frustration results from attempting a task that is beyond our training and experience or is not our calling. When somebody is not your call, when something is not your calling, it's difficult to cope. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Don't try to change what you were when God chose you. 
Frustration can result from trying to do things in our own strength. In Zechariah 4, 6b, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord of hosts. Let the Lord do it through you. Let the Lord do it through you in his own way and in his time. Five, frustration is an indication of a lack of faith and trust in the Lord. Romans 8.25, but if we hope for that we, do, we see not, then do it with patience and wait for it. When you are frustrated, do you shut down or do you become determined to work it out to your relationship with God? How are you with God in prayer? Is there bitterness towards people or towards God that you have refused to pray about? When Moses was frustrated in Exodus 17, 1 to 4, who did he speak to first, God or the people? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. Regard in our frustration, God will want us to be honest with him and express how we feel, even when we have negative emotions towards him. Regardless of the source of frustration, pray to be more patient, trusting, and dependent upon the Lord. Psalm 55, 22 reminds us, cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Bring forth fruit with patience. Always remember that there's so much stress, anger, mental trauma, lawlessness, injustice, intimidation, and high-handedness in our society. Learn to be patient. Learn to be sensitive to the feelings of other people. Avoid unnecessary argument or scuffles. Avoid any sin that is potentially hazardous or violent. Build your personal capacity, strengthen your coping skills, and have faith in God, no matter the provocation, disappointment, or circumstances. Remember, this too shall come to pass. Appreciate that frustration is part and parcel of your journey towards your goal. The greater the goal, the greater the frustrations that come with it. Reassess the frustrations in your mind and accept them. See them as stepping stones, not obstacles. Move through it, not round it. Keep at it until you realize the goal, since there is nothing more satisfying than reaching a goal that once appeared unattainable. It is healthy to feel the emotion of frustration. It is healthy. Becoming familiar with the emotions is a positive step towards uncovering the hidden meaning behind them. Decide if you really want a goal you have set for yourself and ask yourself what achieving that goal will give you or allow you to become if you had it. Having felt the frustration and determined your goal, be clear in your mind on how you intend to achieve that goal or what route you want to take to achieve the goal to get there. Somebody said you don't need to be tall to see far. Just stand on the shoulders of those who have been there before. Use their path to plot yours and use the advice which feels right for you. You are allowed to make mistakes which are likely to have minimal effect on your goal. Make sure you try. And if it doesn't work, learn from the mistake quickly. Start all over again and proceed forward. Act with confidence. Develop the refuse-to-let-go attitude because this is part of the victory. You have a story to tell, very sweet one. Allow your mind, sometimes, even though this is controversial, allow your mind to take a mini vacation as this is likely to place you in a stronger and better position to revisit your goal with greater mental capacity. Always do something for yourself as a reward for your efforts. 
Coming back home, how do we respond appropriately with God's grace when faced with frustration arising from difficulties and crises with family members, with friends, fellow church members, colleagues at work and neighbors? We must allow for healthy emotional expression. We must allow ourselves to feel the hurt or the pain of the person who is expressing his frustration. Subsequently, we should work together on dealing with the immediate situation. We must not look in at the past to apportion blame. Wasting valuable time and energy that could be used to work on the, on the immediate problem. Let's face the conflict as a team. Finally, once the impending crisis is addressed and emotions are calmer, we can discuss the episode and brainstorm on ways to decrease the recording problem. If need be, most times there will be need. We can apologize and ask for forgiveness and receive it. Whereas frustration is an emotion that people express when they cannot achieve their goals, depression is a psychological disorder where a person feels no interest in any activity and feels helpless. So there is hopelessness, there is helplessness, there is loss of interest in activities that you normally enjoy. An excessive level of frustration can cause depression. A frustrated person may show emotions such as anger, unhappiness, disappointment, and even depression, whereas a depressed person may feel de defeated, helpless, worthless, tired, and have suicidal ideas or thoughts. Unlike frustration, depression needs to be treated with therapy or medications. Now we understand the difference. More than 300 million people of all ages suffer from depression. A national depression and happiness poll conducted in 2018, just last year, revealed that 31.6% of the Nigerian population, that's more than 60 million, is at risk of depression, meaning that three out of 10 Nigerians experience depressive symptoms. It is the leading cause of disability worldwide. About 20 to 30% of those attending hospital routinely, routinely, they have not gone there to tell the doctor that they have depression. They've gone there for other complaints. 20 to 30%, they have symptoms of depression, which are not usually recognized. More women are affected by depression than men. Why? Because of hormonal changes. They are the family caregivers. They are the breadwinners in some instances. After the death of husband, lack of male children, low income, difficult relationships, and domestic violence. The burden of depression is on the rise globally. It is a significant factor for the cardiovascular death and stroke. So it is not only hypertension or diabetes that causes stroke. The burden of depression can also lead to cardiovascular events and stroke. While it is normal, and I want you to listen to this, while it is normal to have brief occasional episodes of sadness or unhappiness, because they are not the same with depression, an individual is said to have depression when he or she experiences several of the following symptoms for most of the day, almost every day for at least two weeks. Three things there. For most part of a day, almost every day, and for a period of two weeks. Because some of us confuse unhappiness, sadness, and depression. Those, are just, those sadness, unhappiness are just fleeting emotions. But depression, the symptoms listed there occur most of the day, almost every day, for at least two weeks. So we can start the checklist from today, individually and as a family. I will not go through them because they are listed there and because of time. Causes and risk factors for depression. Past physical, sexual, or emotional abuse 
can increase the vulnerability to depression later in life. So anybody who has been emotionally or sexually or physically abused in the past, that person is a risk. Some drugs, such as steroids, benzodiazepines, codeine, propranol, can increase your risk of depression. When the doctor prescribes for you, it is your right to ask for the work and the side effects of the medications that they are writing for you. Don't just accept them and take them home. Depression may result from personal conflicts or disputes with family members or friends. Sadness or grief from death or loss of a loved one, though natural, may increase the risk of depression. A family history of depression may also increase the risk. Of course, major events of life. Other problems such as social isolation due to other mental illnesses or being cast out of a family or social group when we belong to social groups or organizations and they cast us out. It can contribute to the risk of developing depression. Serious illnesses, of course, most chronic illnesses will always go along with depression later. Nearly 30% of people with substance abuse problems also have depression. Even if drugs or alcohol temporarily makes you feel better, they ultimately will aggravate depression. How do we fight depression? Shift your attention from negative thoughts. The fact that I have just lost my job, I have just lost plenty of money, the money will not come back again, but if you pray and remain positive, you look for other ways to make it up. Remove those negative thoughts. Replace them by more useful exercises. Challenge any negative thinking. Recognize the symptoms of depression and know when they are pulling you down. Don't allow weakness. Don't say, I'm not going to talk about it. Identify the people you can discuss with. Don't see yourself as a burden unto other people. And do not let suicidal thoughts or ideas come to your mind. That can only happen if you remain positive. Set small goals. Usually when you are depressed and you wake up in the morning, you don't want to get out of your bed. You lose interest completely in all activities. You become hopeless and helpless. But start the day, pray. Whatever is pulling you down, get out of that bed. Take a shower, shave, get dressed up. We normally tell those who are about getting retired, what are you going to do during retirement? Doctor, I have not thought about it. I said, okay, you know what to do? Just get a small room and make it an office. Even if you're not going to do anything there, just buy the newspaper every morning, go there and sit down. You, at least you have left the house. You have a job, even though it's not fetching money, but it's fetching peace of mind. Eat breakfast. Most times, because you are heavy, even to eat, even though some people who are depressed overeat, head to work, whatever type of work, but not work that is not in line with the glory of God. Focus on the basics. Reach out to friends and families. Of course, talk to a therapist. Please don't say because I don't want to be a burden on the other people. If you don't want to talk to family and friends, at least see a therapist. If you want to get the best advice possible, you need to talk to an expert. Keep some humor in your life. Avoid or limit alcohol and other substance use. Of course, give your credit. Be proud of any steps and progress you make. Overcome depression with the help of God and his Holy Spirit. Find scriptures that will encourage you to find peace and joy in the midst of depressive circumstances and feelings. I've given you some helpful verses. Psalm 34, 17. Psalm 40, 1 to 3. Romans 8, 38 to 39. Isaiah 41, 10. Depression 
is one of the greatest risk factors for suicide. Suicide almost always occurs in response to suffering or anticipated suffering. Somebody says suicide is the intentional ending of one's own life. Intentional ending of one's own life. It is an act of self-destruction, an escape from oneself, an act of self-defeat. What am I now? What I am now and what I would have loved to be. These are the thoughts that go through our mind. Where I am now and where I would have loved to be. What I have been before and what I have suddenly become. Where I have been before and where I have suddenly found myself. What I have been expecting and what has happened to me. What will people say about me? Oh no, it's better to commit suicide. For most people who commit suicide, these are the thoughts that go through their minds before the act is committed. The high rate of suicide, especially amongst young people in Nigeria, is becoming worrisome. One person commits suicide across the world every 40 seconds. So you can imagine, since I started speaking, some people have already committed suicide across the globe every 40 seconds. So it is not a problem that the church will not talk about. According to the World Health Organization, one million suicides occur annually. About 90% of them are related to depression. Now look at that age group. The age group at maximum risk is 15 years to 45 years. Suicide is the third leading cause of death, third leading cause of death for people aged 15 to 25 years. Now the next figures will surprise you. 29,000, 19,000, 13,000 in the USA. 29,000 people commit successful suicides in the US every year, whereas Compare that to 19,000 mothers and 13,000 AIDS related deaths. That shows you the magnitude of the problem. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death worldwide. Females are more likely to attempt suicide. However, males are four times more likely to successfully commit suicide. Now, back home, the World Health Organization ranked Nigeria as the fifth most suicide prone nation with 15,000 suicides per every 100,000 people. Some have wrongly argued that if one body, if one's body is viewed as one's own property, then suicide ought to be allowed. But the body is not your own. First Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. You surely know that your body is a temple where the Holy Spirit lives. The Spirit is in you, and it's a gift from God. You are no longer your own. Human beings, lives, they live in communities. As such, suicide grieves those left behind, as well as producing guilt and strained relationships. You have taken your own life out of misdirected self-love. Before we look at the specific causes of suicide, let us take a look at the characters who committed suicide in the Bible and why they did it. Saul in 1 Samuel 31, 1 to 6, and Chronicles 10, 4 to 5, he was the first king of Israel. He committed suicide by falling on his sword, once wounded. He did not want the worthless Philistines to abuse him. That was his reason for committing suicide. His armor bearer, in the same verse, he committed suicide by falling on his sword and he died with his master. Ahithophel, in 2 Samuel 17 23, he was a counselor to David and Absalom. He committed suicide by hanging when his advice was pawned just because the advice was pawned. 
Zimri in 1 Kings 16, 15 to 19. He was the fifth king of Israel. He was deposed just after one week. He committed suicide by setting the fortress on fire. Judas is carried in Matthew 27, 3 to 5. He was one of the 12 apostles. He committed suicide by hanging after betrayal of Jesus Christ. Abimelech in Judges 9, 52 to 54, the son of Gideon and sixth judge of Israel. This was an example of assisted suicide. He was killed by his armor bearer at his request when he was wounded. He did not want it to be mentioned that it was the woman who dropped a heavy rock and cracked his skull. He didn't want it to be known that it was a woman who killed him. So note the following about these characters I have mentioned. All the biblical examples of successful suicide, they were men. No single woman there. None of them was personally praised for their actions. None. All of them were spiritually bankrupt or went through a period of spiritual collapse before their suicide. Most of them were in pain or afraid before suicide. The scripture generally presents these examples of suicide as a fitting end to a wicked and unrepentant li life. The major reasons for suicide are itemized there, and I'm sure you, you, you go through them. They are very similar to the causes of depression. Some of them are religious fundamentalism inspired, religious ritual, escape from punishment, escape from pain, terrorism, and loss of status. I would like to talk very briefly about adolescent or youth suicides, and I want the parents to pay undivided attention. Remember that this is a time of sexual identity and relationships. Some of these youths or adolescents are vulnerable to stress and worry because of the pressure to fit in socially, to perform well academically, and to act responsibly. There is a desire for independence, which often conflicts with the rules and expectations set by others. The risk is higher in those of them who already have problems, like mood disorders, those of them who have attempted suicide before, and those of them who have access to non-prescription drugs, those of them who have access to firearms, where you have family crisis, those of them who are victims of bullying by the parents or their friends, and those of them who have witnessed breakups or failures of relationships. Many adolescents or youths believe erroneously that the only way to get back at their parents is to commit suicide. Parents are too hard or wicked, not allowing them to do things that are trending or fashionable. Wicked parents who beat or punish them always. Parents who refuse to give them money for overindulgence. Preferential treatment of other siblings or encouraging sibling rivalry. Spousal abuse. Refusal to send them abroad. They cannot, some of them cannot tolerate the socioeconomic status of their family. And they see that as a fault or weakness or failure of their parents. Ignoring your children when they seek your attention. The youths must, however, be informed and they must understand the pain, the agony, the humiliation, the feeling of guilt, the suffering, the shame, and the stigma. They are subjecting their parents, their siblings, their friends, their classmates, their teachers, coaches, and the community. Most importantly, they have denied themselves the glorious chance of redemption and the beauty of a great future. Jeremiah 29, 11 reminds us, I will bless you with a future filled with hope, a future of success, not of suffering. Why is suicide wrong? Why is it wrong? Suicide is a sin against God as a creator and sustainer of life. It rejects God's sovereignty and usurps his prerogative in regard to life and death. The Christian church has always viewed suicide as a grave sin. 
the difference between suicide and other sins is that successful suicide allows no time for repentance. By committing suicide, the individual has denied himself time for repentance. Suicide is a violation of the sixth commandment. Suicide disregards the image of God and the sanctity of human life. As recorded in Genesis 1, 26 to 27, the cemetery is a place nobody wants to visit and nobody is in a hurry to go there because of the loneliness of the cemetery and the scary feeling it evokes. The late fellow Nikolapo once described Nigerians as suffering and smiling people. We are very optimistic and we are once described as the happiest people in the world. Not long ago, we had a commissioner for happiness in one of our states. Suicide is poor stewardship of one's body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Suicide demonstrates misdirected love and is injurious to others. Matthew 22, 36 to 39. Suicide overlooks the value of human suffering. Romans 5, 3 to 5. We gladly suffer because we know that suffering helps us to endure. And endurance builds character, which gives us a hope that will never disappoint us. Suicide is a fatalistic response to imagined stigma, shame, or disappointment. Believers are called to have joy and hope in the midst of current trials, looking forward to the age to come. Suicide fails to recognize the un unnatural nature of death. Romans 5.12 there is no direct relationship between poverty and suicide. The highest rates of suicide are actually found in high-income societies. And the 10 most popular spots for suicide in the world are in developed countries. They are not in Africa, even though we are beginning to develop our own in Lagos, the lagoon, that bridge where people normally go to. Finally, Jesus refused to commit suicide, and Paul prevented it in Acts 16, 27 to 28. How to recognize signs of suicide? When somebody keeps on talking about suicide, be more sensitive. Verbal hints such as, I won't be around much longer, or my situation is hopeless. Those repeated words, should alert you. Statements about hopelessness, helplessness, and worthlessness. Overwhelming signs of guilt, shame, or rejection. These are things that should alert us as family, as friends. When there are changes in school performance of a child, when somebody is preoccupied with the talks of death, death every time, he needs help, and we must not slow in giving that help. Sudden happiness and calm, especially after episodes of depression. Somebody who has been depressed, he's not been given any therapy, he's not been given any medications, suddenly he starts jumping around, he becomes so happy. Then you have to start looking more carefully. Bizarre thoughts, dramatic changes, in personality or appearance of individuals. When people become too irritable on a consistent basis, loss of interest in material things, disposal of material things, visiting loved ones. These are practical examples. When people suddenly, they start sharing all the things that they have without any reason, without any obvious reason, or they start visiting people. It's not, that's not the person's habit before. These are signs. Certain ones affairs in order. Responding to suicide. The gospel has a response to the conditions that lead many people to consider or attempt suicide. Encouraging suicide communicates that there is no answer to despair 
and comfort in affliction. This is the opposite of what the gospel promises. Two, doctors have been encouraged to screen for suicide risk in the primary health care settings, especially not necessarily for everybody, but for people who have poor family function, poor family support. When, when, you, when the doctors talk to the patient and there is a family history of suicide, there is a risk for suicide in that person too. People who abuse substance or alcohol, people who have chronic illnesses, people who have recent onset of frightening illness, events leading to humiliation, shame, or despair. Some of our children have committed suicide because they said their girlfriend or their boyfriends left them. They consider that humiliating. Those with access to firearms then try to be sensitive to those signs of suicide that we mentioned earlier. When you suspect, don't be afraid to ask pointed questions. For youths, ask their parents and their guidance about evidence of suicidal thoughts, whether they have any plans, whether they've noticed any strange behaviors, whether there are changes in their mood or disposition. Persuade them or even accompany them or even take them to get help. The family, they can get help from family members, from the church, counseling experts. Refer them to available resources and don't just stop there. Please stay involved in their lives. Churches, church and support groups have enormous responsibilities in this regard. There are factors that are protective against suicide. You will try to enhance those factors. For instance, what is this person's ability to cope with stress or bad times? You are try to identify those coping skills and strengthen them in that individual. What is the, le the level of this person's religious belief? his spirituality, his level of commitment or responsibility to children and loved ones. Those are things that you can strengthen. Enrollment in social support groups. Yes, encourage them to belong to groups that can support them. Ongoing, of course, if they have been in therapeutic relationships, let them continue. To those who have been affected by suicide, treat suicide as normal deaths. You didn't know about it. But you will grieve, yes, treat as normal deaths. Listen to people who are colleagues or friends to the person who committed the suicide. They may give you useful tips as to pre-suicidal factors and assist with preventive strategies. Pray to God. Meet the material needs of others who have such risk factors. September 10 every year, it's World Suicide Prevention Day. It is so serious that the World Health Organization has even set a day. It is to spread awareness about suicide prevention. It means that all the bodies in the world that are concerned with health have recognized that suicide has become a very big problem. What is the role of government? One, policy interventions that will guarantee welfare equity, educational empowerment, employment, job satisfaction, patriotism, and self-worthiness. Two, implementation of the existing laws and regulations on procurement and acquisition of firearms, importation and distribution of controlled drugs and substances, controlled sales of pesticides and insecticides, restricting access to lethal methods through firearms control, Four, some countries have detoxified the domestic gas that are used in homes of people. Five, installing barriers at common jumping sites. There are sites that are famous for committing suicide. 
Six, improve public awareness on mental health issues, especially anxiety and depressive disorders, which can affect people from all walks of life, no matter their background. Helplines and counseling centers should be readily available, as in other countries. Most Nigerians don't know who to go to or to talk to when they are depressed. Other countries have helplines and counseling centers, and the people are aware. There is urgent need to create more mental health centers that are properly funded and train more mental health specialists. Some prominent Nigerians have recommended mental evaluation of our political leaders who continue to take decisions that create more mental problems among Nigerians. Eight, regulation of irresponsible media reporting, which tend to glamorize suicide by publicizing suicide hotspots and make it appealing. Nine, urgent implementation of existing legislation that criminalize attempted suicide. Government must take appropriate measures to convert the people's pessimism into optimism through people-centered governance and delivery of democratic dividends. The role of the church. Christianity acknowledges the emptiness and brokenness of the world and offers hope, newness, and abundant life. Jesus shared in man's pain and suffering and provides redemption and restoration. This should be the message of the church. Two, strengthen the Sunday schools and other programs that continue to keep the teens, the adolescents and youths in close contact with the scriptures and direction of God. Three, the adult societies, unions and committees must continue to fellowship, identify challenges and give support where necessary. Four, create and sustain media programs that strengthen people's faith, broadcast contemporary mental health issues while providing helplines and counseling units. Five, some Christian denominations should self-regulate on the unhealthy elevation of members' expectations, unhealthy achievement motivation, and unrealistic message of prosperity while focusing more on redemption and salvation. Unmet expectations lead to frustration, anger, and their consequences, such as ending it all. The role of the family. Let us try and improve at our various family levels, family harmony, and relationships. A dysfunctional family is never together. They cannot recognize deviant or suicide risk in their children. A dysfunctional family have no time to train and guide their children. They have no time to pray and have no time to inculcate acceptable societal values and norms. We all remember Frank Colise, the questions he used to ask regarding the nine o'clock news. Where are your children? For most of us who are seated here, where are your children? What are they doing now? Improve neighborhood cohesion. Who is your neighbor? What influence do they have on your family, especially your children? Three, a good home with good parenting style and practices provides joy, happiness, and resilience, which are necessary for good mental health. At the individual level, one, recognize the first thing is to recognize and accept that you have a problem. Nobody will recognize that when there is some deviation in your habits, in your behavior, in your body, you will know. Two, accept that you need help and seek for help. Try and find out if there are hotlines and counseling centers, even though this is readily available in other countries. Encourage yourself with the scriptures. Develop social communication and support through families and friends. Very importantly, please avoid unrealistic goals and expectations. Six, develop coping skills. 
Generate a list of calming activities, activities that calm you, or hobbies that are enjoyable and accessible. Do not keep items that may be used to cause self-harm. And finally, ensure proper self-care and acceptable lifestyle practices. I will conclude with these comforting words from Isaiah 41, 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Second Corinthians 4, 8 to 9. We often suffer, but we are never crushed. Even when we don't know what to do, we never give up. In times of trouble, God is with us. And when we are knocked down, we get up again. We never give up. Our bodies are gradually dying, but we, we ourselves are being made stronger each day. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your attention. Oh,